Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Sunday talk within the nine sided circle. I'm one of your two hosts, Nor Kyle. And I'm the other one of your two hosts. I might even be two of your three hosts, Mashtaq Ali. <laughs> Big ego, what can I say? Yep. Taking up a lot of space, which is exactly what we want. We want everyone to take up plenty of space here in this conversation. So, uh, thank you so much for joining us, whether you're joining us here live on Zoom or on the replay. If you also want to join us, you can connect with us via any of the contact formats below, and we find it especially helpful if you join our mailing list or our Facebook group called the Nine Sided Circle Forum. What else? We have two events coming up, which I briefly want to share about because I feel like it's it's an ongoing thing that we got to get the word out about these things we still have a, um, a week before we're closing registration for our Sur sufi sofet which is like our sufi directed study group i could say when we meet once a month and we definitely recommend anyone who would like to join that to expect to be an active participant either you can show up to the talks each month or you can make sure that you watch the videos and follow up with any questions you might have we have sufi practices that we do and we definitely go more into the islamic foundations without necessarily saying oh people need to be a muslim because obviously if you've you been don't. around here a while that is not what we believe when we share about sufism we just think it's a very meaningful path for people who are drawn to this specific flavor of work and we also have our retreat coming up in may that's going to be held from may 8th to the 12th in sweden and that's the first time we're going to be able to have everybody get together in person who would like to join us it's going to be a really beautiful time and i think we're going to find it especially meaningful to be able to be in physical space together and learn a lot of the things that we're not able to teach via the online platforms that we have available to us so if either of those things interest you we will have links in the description below for you to sign up and you'll have all the information you need but if there's anything that's missing you can always email us at our nine-sided circle or info at address and you also find that below as well Without further ado, is there anything else I need to add? Oh yeah, there is something very, very important. Okay, what's that? Um, like this video. Oh yeah, the whole help like, us, comment, subscribe thing. Yeah, yes. help us by liking the video because if you like it, then we go up in the uh, the algorithm and people find us more easily. Subscribe to the video if you haven't because we like it when you subscribe and make a comment because we love comments we we live for your comments so yes. there you go all right we did our spiel hopefully it wasn't too long thanks for putting up with us in yeah. that leaves us with i'm sorry for whatever is going on in the background hopefully it's fireworks. Just fireworks yeah yeah maybe for you know lunar new year or something but yeah we're going to be talking about the connection between our theme for this month, you know, our impromptu theme for the month, which has been alchemy, and you'll be able to watch our previous, I think, three videos now, where we've gone into deeper conversations about various aspects of alchemy and how that relates to both Sufism and some of the Gurdjieff work, which we also kind of tend to be inspired by here today we are going in a direction that is definitely relevant to what we're talking about tonight but from an even different you know another different point a stranger weirder yes so we're going to be talking about the rosicrucian connection yes so we have a lot to talk about there don't we so tell us ever a so more, much Mishtag. yeah okay so the Rosicrucian Brotherhood. I will tell you that before um, 1614, nobody ever heard of this group, regardless of what any modern Rosicrucians say. There is no way to trace this organization any further than that date. 
how would we um, categorize them today? Because we actually live in the neighborhood of their current one of the one of the groups. Yes, there yeah. are several groups like claiming to have Rosicrucian ad, ad antecedents. Yeah. yeah, but we live uh, within a few miles of the ancient and mystical order Rosicrucis, known as Amorc. Uh, they have a huge. Uh, complex down in San Jose. It literally takes up a city block. Uh, and it's actually pretty spectacular. If you're ever in San Jose, it's worth a visit. They have a top-notch Egyptian museum. They have beautiful grounds. They have an observatory. They have a library that they now let people actually go inside of. It used to be you couldn't get in there unless you were a member of the group. Uh, and uh, at one point, yeah. this was previous to the pandemic that we went and visited for yes. my first time. And at that time, I mean, I don't know where it ended up, but they were actually going to start offering alchemy classes there. Yeah, they have actually, I believe, just broken ground on their alchemy museum. God, well, yeah, I think we're going to have to go visit there soon, won't we? Yes, we are. Yeah, they have this as part of the Egyptian museum. They have an entire museum devoted to alchemy. Anybody on my friends list can go look at the photos that we took of it. Uh, if you can't, tough luck. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, you'll just have to see for yourself somehow. And anyway, though, so this is all tied back to these. Sufism and alchemy. Yeah. So how are you connecting those dots to start? All right. So the first thing we have to do is to look at the myth of CRC, which is the name that uh, was pinned to the, uh, the uh, mythological originator of the Rosicrucian society. Now, in 1614 in Germany, a pamphlet was uh, released and it was called the Fama Fraternitatis. For those of you who are interested in this, there are three pamphlets that we're going to talk about. Uh, I will prepare a PDF of all three of them and they will be available to anybody who is uh, in the um, Nine Sided Circle forum group. Or if you email me and ask me very nicely, I might email it to you if you don't want to be a member of the group. But why wouldn't you? Uh, but anyway, uh, the Fama was very interesting because nobody had ever heard of it. Now, Germany at this time was a very interesting place. It was a hotbed of mystical stuff, mostly Freemasonry. And this group basically said, hey, we're the real deal. Nobody else is. And, and here's how it, we came about. And we've been organized here in the West for 100 years, but we have been keeping secret until now. And now we're going to tell everybody about us. Hmm. And go ahead. Another thing that's interesting, like as far as background cultural stuff going on, is that this is just... 30 plus years after Martin Luther. About 100 years after the, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah after okay. the Reformation. Yeah. So we have a lot of stuff percolating at that time around, th there's a lot of change happening, a lot of pushing back against the status quo that was at that point had spread across Europe of, you know, the Pope running the show and also you know, Islam on the periphery. Yeah. And whether they like to admit it today or not, the Fama puts Islam right in the middle of this, which is why some, some people have suggested that the Rosicrucians are a Sufi front group, which I have always found interesting, but we will talk about that in detail. Shall I tell them about the Fama? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but... No, no. So, the Fama tells the story of Brother C.R.C., who at the tender age of 16, 
took off with uh, an elder brother to go to the Holy Land. But his elder brother, who was called P.A.L., and you'll find this all through this document, names are just initials. And this was considered mysterious at the time. Um, uh, his elder brother, who was his guide, died in Cyprus. And so never came to Jerusalem. Um, and for some reason, Brother CRC did not return to Europe or go on to the Holy Land, but he went to Damascus, uh, called Damasco in the document. Uh, and uh, it suggests a couple of things he, that he was sick when he got there. It literally says because of the feebleness of his body, he remained there. But it also says that he was very skilled in physic, which in this case uh, may mean uh, physics as we understand it, or it may mean medicine. Uh, and with it, he uh, obtained much favor with the Turks. Now, at this time, Damascus was part of the Ottoman Empire. Most of uh, the Middle East, uh, north of Egypt, was part of the Ottoman Empire. Um, and while he was there, he met what the documents call wise men of Damkar in Arabia. Now, Damkar is actually a, a corruption of the name of a city in Yemen that was a hot, hotbed of Sufism at that time. And that was Tamar. Um, and he was um, taken with the, the wonders that they wrought and how nature was discovered by them, according to the document. I like the way they phrased that. So these were natural scientists and probably physicians as well uh, for reasons that we'll see later on. Uh, and he was so excited by this that uh, he made a bargain with the Arabians and th that they should carry him for a certain sum to Damar. And this was, he was 16 when this happened. Um, this is interesting because, do you guys know what the Tarzan phenomena is? You, have you heard of this? No, it doesn't seem like okay. any of them have. Okay, so the Tarzan phenomena is this. The white guy shows up somewhere. In the, in the case of Tarzan, he shows up in Africa and he out Africans the Africans, he out apes the apes. He is by dint of his noble blood superior to everyone around him. And this is a mythology that uh, we see over and over again uh, coming out of Europe of the, uh, the idea of the natural superior, superiority of the European over lesser peoples. And the Fama has more than a little bit of that in it. Um, it has a sense of, oh, here is this CRC, and they were expecting him, and he is wonderful, and they knew all about him, and they had prepared a place for him because he's going to be really, really special. Um, take that, please, as propaganda. So uh, so he got there and uh, they showed him all of their secrets uh, where he was quite amazed. It says in the Fama that he learned there better the Arabian tongue. He actually learned to speak and read Arabic and he translated the book M into good Latin 
which he afterwards brought with him. Now, the, there has been a question as to what uh, the book M was. My theory, for reasons that we will go into perhaps later, is that it was actually the Shams al-Ma'arif, which is a, um, I would have to say it's a Sufi text, but it's a text on magic. It contains astrology, it contains talismans, it contains all of these different things. And there are... Yeah, you have a copy of the Shams al Marif right there. A translation of it, anyway. In translation, yes. Yeah. I, I am hot to get my hands on an Arabic copy, but uh, my teacher had one in the library, and it was interesting to go through. So this is the, they translate it as the Son of Knowledge. Yep. Which is a pretty good translation of the name. Yeah, and the translation it's, it's, it, yeah. is and, Amina in Lois. Yeah, and Marif is, there are two words that can be translated into English as knowledge. The first is ilm. And you can think of that as book learning, scholar, scholarship. Arif is a whole different class of learning it is uh, it's gnosis it's direct inspiration so this isn't a book of book learning it's a book of direct uh, experience some of which i don't recommend people have but anyway i'm pretty sure that that is the book that is talked about in the text uh, and So he learned to speak uh, good Arabic, read and write it. Uh, and this was the place where he learned his physic and his mathematics, uh, whereof the world has much to rejoice. And we will see why later as well. Um, after three years of study here in Yemen, uh, he shipped himself over to Egypt, where he remained not long, long enough. Uh, and he studied plants and animals there, which is salient to our story. From there, he sailed over the whole Mediterranean to come to Fez, um, which is where the Arabians had directed him. They said, yeah, go to Fez. Fez Fez is a city in Morocco, and it has long been a center of knowledge and learning and science and all of these things, going back hundreds and hundreds of years. Very cool place. Uh, so he spent a long time in Fez studying everything, physics, mathematics, medicine, um, and uh, the manuscript says that uh, the people of Fez were the most skillful in this. Um, and it goes on to suggest that the men of Germany would be uh, envious of this and well uh, wise to find uh, some of this knowledge. Interesting passage here. It says, at Fez, he did get acquaintance with those which are commonly called the elementary inhabitants who revealed unto him of their secrets. Now, that suggests to me uh, that he was, somebody taught him how to contact jinn and learn from them. And that goes back to the Shams al-Marif, uh, which has a whole section in how to evoke jinn and learn from them. Not recommended. Do not do this at home, kids. Uh, it, it is, it's a very dangerous thing to do. But he did it. He learned cool stuff from the gen. Uh, and he 
he suggests, or the the manuscript suggests that uh, he found their their magic and their Kabbalah, uh, which is not Jewish Kabbalah. It's it's a term that he's using as uh, not pure. And uh, because it was Islamic, it was not as cool as the Christian stuff. This is very, very Christian on its surface, uh, which I forgot to mention up front. So he does all of this learning, spends a couple of years in Fez, and then moves to Spain, which is just across the water. And he spends time studying in Spain. Now, those of you who know the history of the time, Spain has recently been reconquered from the Moors. Uh, and But there is still a whole lot of uh, <coughs> the old Islamic learning, a whole lot of access to the philosophers, to the, the books, all of this kind of stuff. So he spends time in Spain. And from Spain... Um, he goes back to Germany and he starts building a, a little temple for himself. And then he uh, starts teaching first four people and then seven people, uh, teaching all of this secret stuff to. And out of that group, he founds the Rosicrucian Order. Uh, and it gives the names here. You got Brother GV, you got Brother IA, you got Brother IO, all of these famous people who he's teaching. Uh, and they named it the Fraternity of the Rosy Cross. Uh, they developed their own uh, language and writing with a large dictionary. Uh, they had all sorts of uh, rituals that they do. They work from the book M and they built a building called the Sancti Spiritus, which means the uh, Holy Spirit. Uh, and they did all sorts of work there. They agreed on certain rules, and I'm going to tell you what they are. There are six of them. The first is that nobody in their order should uh, claim to do anything other than curing the sick, and they should only do that for free. The second is that nobody in their order should wear any kind of special clothing, but should follow the custom of whatever country they were in. Third is that they were going to meet on a particular day at the house Sancti Spiritus uh, or send a, a written reason why they couldn't be there. Once a year, Fourth, right? Yeah, once a, once a year. Uh, fourth, every brother should look about for a worthy person who after his decease might succeed him. The fifth is that the word RC should be their seal, mark, and character. Six, the fraternity should remain secret for 100 years. So they did all of this stuff. They had uh, a good time. Brothers died. Other brothers were brought in. And uh, then... There is a description of the tomb of uh, Christian Rosenkrauts, which is a, the tomb description is an alchemical uh, simile, metaphor, whatever. So this is one of their little secrets is hidden in there. And um, it basically ends the document with a call to anybody who is interested uh, to uh, contact them and join the Rosicrucians. So this appeared and lots and lots of people tried to find them, to join them. Uh, and nobody Do, could. Yeah, because yeah. they express in the text that they have 
stash of gems and yeah that's especially metals. in the second text yeah all right i'll hold on to that yeah i'll hold on to that for later so lots of people want to find them they're very excited now at this time the main mystical society in europe was uh the freemasons this was before the illuminati and the various other groups it was i think it was before cagliostro but maybe not but freemasons so the rosicrucian order was dressed up to look like freemasons only with a completely different um ground and basis there is a very strong connection to egypt in it uh, and to the middle east uh, as you saw christian rosenkrauts or brother crc uh, got all of his training in the islamic world and not anywhere else. Damascus, Yemen, Egypt, Morocco, and then a little bit in Spain. Though I think Spain was probably secret postgraduate work, assuming that any of this is real. <laughs> so everybody's excited. Nobody can find them. A year passes. And next year, another pamphlet is pub pu published. That pamphlet is called the Confessio Fraternitatis, uh, which means the Confession of the Fraternity. Now, this one is quite a bit different than the first. It is not so much the legend. It talks about the order, uh, the nature of the order unfolding in the fama and stuff like that but it is uh, overtly anti-Catholic, anti-Muslim, and highly political. And this is where they mentioned, hey, we're, we're, you know, we're alchemists. We have gold and silver and jewels that we make ourselves. Mm. And if you happen to be a politician or a king or a prince, and you would like to learn our stuff and to uh, be supportive of us, we might send a little bit of that your way. Uh, so there's like an incentive. Yeah. Beyond just the pursuit of knowledge and all that stuff. Yeah. And then there's uh, the, uh, the assertion that they have the true Christianity. Mm. I mean, we're talking about here we are in the Reformation. And Protestant Reformation. Um, yeah, Protestant Reformation. And already, I mean, that started with uh, Martin Luther nailing his uh, 97 theses onto the church door. But within that hundred years, there have been a number of different splits in the Protestant uh, church. I mean, it was like somebody tossed a hand grenade in the middle of the of the Christian church and just went boom and blew pieces everywhere. Mm. And everybody got to come up with uh, whatever it was they thought the real theology was. And so this kind of steps right into the middle of that and goes, yeah, we, we know the real secrets. And they basically claim to have all the real, the real secrets to everything. Uh, yeah, and uh, they they claim that they're offering their treasures, meaning both wealth and knowledge, freely. Yeah. Uh, but we never actually see that. So this comes back uh, and it, it, there's not that much to say about the Confessio. I, I highly recommend that you read it. Um, and like I said, I will uh, 
make sure that you have a copy of it translated into English. The Confessio was not originally published in German, strangely enough. It was originally published in Latin. Uh, and so a year later, in 1716, another docu document appears, and it's called The Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkrantz. This is the first time that the name Christian Rosenkrantz is mentioned in all of this. And I should point out that Rosenkrantz, uh, which is Rose Cross in German, is spelled with a K, not a C. Uh, so, the Chemical Wedding is an alchemical play, and hidden within it is uh, an entire initiatory cycle. It goes over seven days, and it is um, the seven days of Passover, of Easter. Of, and, you know, it's related to this. Um, and it starts with uh, Easter, uh, the evening before Easter Day. And then it goes on for seven days after it. Uh, interestingly enough, in this document, uh, they, there's a symbol called the hieroglyphic monad, which uh, was created and written about by Dr. John Dee, who was uh, astrologer to Queen Elizabeth and a, a very interesting fellow in his own right. And they incorporate that into this, which points towards the whole Enochian craziness. Uh, so this goes through a whole, he has a kind of a dream and he finds himself in a prison and he, there are ways that he gets out. Uh, there's long poems. It's got some psychedelic qualities to it. Yeah, it has too. some real psychedelic qualities. And the main psychedelic quality is that of an initiatory dream or an initiatory play. And it is said that within this is uh, a way to do self-initiation. So this showed up and then nothing not a word from these people ever again silence crickets they don't jump up and say hey we we have started a recruiting center right here if you want to join the rosicrucian order just hop on over and we'll sign you up And a lot of very famous people tried to find them to no avail. Now, shortly after, groups claiming to be Rosicrucian showed up. But as far as we can tell, there is no direct connection between them and any ancient order or any of the antecedents to whatever Brother CRC actually learned. And that's the story. Yeah, you know, we could follow this all the way up to the present day with uh, the various Rosicrucian groups out there now who do have ways that you can just, I mean, plop down your money, sign up, you're a member. That's all it takes. It is not a mystery school anymore. You don't even have to have somebody uh, recommend you like you used to have to have with the Masons. Um, and nothing, and I... I have studied these people. I actually went and joined the Amorc Rosicrucian order when I was living a little bit south of here because uh, I wanted access to their library. Yeah, the I was only way say, you could, yeah, you the were only a way member. You, I was a member because <laughs> I wanted the library. <laughs> and uh, it's a great library, by the way. Uh, their teachings 
are basically they look like most of them are cribbed either from theosophy uh masonry or uh yeah, the golden dawn yeah i mean there was definitely i remember being at the museum and seeing like big alchemical diagrams and stuff on yeah the walls and... yeah they had a really powerful interest in alchemy but um they didn't really teach it back back in the day but building an alchemical laboratory, which I did do later, um, is not an easy thing. Expensive too, huh? Yep. Yeah, just the glassware alone is going to cost you a couple grand. Yeah, to do it right. Yeah. Yep. So here you have all of this. Now, what was this all about? Some people say it was just a complete hoax. Somebody was uh, being doing the uh, the mid or the Renaissance version of Operation Mindfuck. They were creating a uh, a thing to get people all excited and send them off on wild wild goose, goose chase. chases. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, other people have suggested and this is this is more popular in the islamic world in the the world of sufis that this was a sufi front group this was not even really a group but this was something that sufis did to rattle europe in a particular way and if that was the case it succeeded i because, mean that would be a yeah. brilliant move if so yeah yeah, and it's not, and it's something that I wouldn't put beyond them. You know, it, it wouldn't be the first time that something like that happened. Do we have a way of knowing if that is absolutely the truth? No. But we do know something about the symbology of the rose cross if you look over here uh to my to your right. right yeah you will see uh what i believe was the original rose cross something like it this is an ankh uh, it is the egyptian symbol for life and in the center of it is um the sacred blue lotus of the Egyptians. Now, you should know that the German word for lotus is um, sea rose. Sea it's meaning pond. Ocean, yeah. pond. Yeah. Pond, yeah. Yeah, it means a pond rose. Same in Swedish, nakros. Um, and I think that if I were a German knocking around Egypt or Morocco, I would not have a name for this flower uh, that was any, that what do you want to say? Not a discrete name. So they called it, they called it Nakros or Sea Rose. And so this became the Rose and the Cross. Now, why do I say this? the documents talk about um, some initiatory wine i have to go back and find the, the right thing that that there were sacraments that were given the blue lotus has been used for centuries as a tool for investigating the psyche it is a psychedelic um, Pretty gentle, and, though. Yeah, pretty gentle, but it has been used that way for a very, very long time. Uh, and I suspect that this was the actual sacrament of this group, assuming that I'm not just making all of this up. And, <laughs> yeah. And so why this is important is that this is the pivot point where alchemy went from 
uh, being uh, alchemy in Europe went from being greatly focused on turning base metals into gold or silver or producing uh, stones to something more spiritual. And if I were a Sufi who was trying to shake up Europe, that would be the exact kind of thing that I would inject into the culture. That, oh, here's this alchemical process, and it's not just for doing this physical thing, but there is this spiritual aspect to it. And here, here, drink this, you'll understand. So mm -hmm. to me, that is the most important thing about the Rosicrucian enlightenment is that it caused a certain set of ideas to enter into uh, common understanding in Europe. Yeah. So last week we touched on how Sufis encounter and utilize alchemy. So let's say that you know, those are the things that were happening in place, places where Sufism was happening, or what we call Sufism today. And this is theoretically taking those things and slipping them inside the European context. Yeah. And seeing what happens. And rather than hanging around to create a secret society and, and give people direction, they left people to figure it out for themselves. It's like, if you tell people, hey, there is a way that you can do this thing, people will figure out how to do it, even if you were making it up. Case in point, right? Yeah. Yep. Well, you know, until the Wright brothers got their plane off the ground, nobody thought heavier than air flight was possible. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so this is sort of the same kind of thing. Uh, this gave Europe something deeper than what the Masons were, were offering and definitely deeper than what the churches were offering. And I suspect that people went out and started figuring it out for themselves. There were these hints. Oh, there are books. Did you know that there are books? You might find them in Spain. You might find them in Fez. You might find them in, in Egypt. You might find them in Damascus. These books can tell you things, right? There are people who you can go and talk to who might tell you things. And what are the more adventurous people going to do? They're going to go out and find that shit, whether the story is real or not. Mm -hmm. And these do, you know, incidentally, the listed places of Damascus and Fez and et cetera, and even Spain, those are places where Sufis are doing their thing actively yeah. and presently. Yeah, th those are all hotbeds of Sufism. Exactly, yeah. So if I were a Sufi, I might do something like this. I might interject ideas into the world to act as an inoculation against the uh, sedimentation of consciousness going on all around me it does seem a bit chaotic good to me you know yeah it's definitely chaotic good <laughs> yeah. so that's our story and we're sticking to it what do you think yeah what are do you have thoughts and questions i know this was kind of this is like a a telling of a history, but that doesn't mean we don't want to hear your ideas as well. Yeah, because we could be entirely full of it. I mean, and, yeah, you could yeah. read these and then come back and be like, mm, I don't see it, which is legit, you know, and we would be interested to hear why that uh, why that might be and, and what comes up for you instead, potentially as uh, a way to 
recontextualize this these texts yeah so what do you think nancy i'm wondering how much truth you guys think actually turned up in among the rosicrucians or the freemasons uh a little here and there mm -hmm. um the evolution of secret societies is is interesting and i think all of them started with some kernel of truth except the mm -hmm. ones that were started by cult leaders uh, and there's for a lot that, of, you have yeah. yeah you have to look at personalities like uh pagliostro's uh egyptian rite of freemasonry mm -hmm. was definitely a cult uh, it was based around his personality. Uh, Blue Lodge Freemasonry, not so much. There is no, uh, they were based around their, their legend, their, their myth. Uh, with the Rosicrucians, this is purely based around the myth. Because remember, after the third document, these people completely disappeared. They did not stick around to capitalize on their press. And we never, to this day, know who wrote the document there's all sorts of speculations but there is zero hard evidence to any of this that i've ever been able to find yeah and it's interesting that we have one in german one in latin and then one in german again do you think yeah. it's possible that these could have been written by unrelated that's a authors? definite possibility yeah uh, especially between the confessio uh, the confessio and the fama the confessio is a very different document Mm -hmm. uh different in tone in a lot of different ways it's way more arrogant <laughs> it is it's way more right. arrogant yeah um let me give you an example what my notes on the confessio here yeah because at this point all i'm seeing evidence of and it's not nothing is the ability to attract money and have an organization yeah except that these guys never attracted any money well, those guys didn't, but I mean, these people who are building libraries and temples yeah. and such, they have money. Yep, they do. They do manage to have money and they do manage to have an organization. Um, it's not like it, like, for example, the one that we visited, it's probably not quite like it used to be. Yeah. But and they are yeah, managing to, to keep plodding along. And obviously, if they're breaking ground on a new building and stuff, then they must not be doing too badly. Yeah, the, I don't think they're doing as well as they were back in the 60s, but mm -hmm. uh, they're still managing to to make stuff happen, which is good because, frankly, what they've done uh, is beautiful. If you go to their place, the, the Egyptian museum they have is stunning, and it has an authorized replica of the bust of nefertiti which they took down for some reason hopefully they'll put it back up yeah we but should go back soon yeah if you don't want i forget whether it's back in uh egypt or it's still locked up in germany but uh yeah it's it, the bust of nefertiti is absolutely stunning and i've seen the duplicate and i've seen the original and i can barely tell the difference between the two mm. cool yeah so they do some good stuff. Uh, you know, as for the other Rosicrucian named groups, Max Heindahl had one back in the day. Um, it was more theosophy than anything else. Um, there's a couple of others that are around today. They don't seem like they're doing any harm. Maybe doing some good. And it is possible for each of every one of all of you who are listening to this to think seriously about retracing Christian Rosenkraus's steps and discovering what he discovered rather than just reading a story about it. It's only a suggestion. Yeah. Nancy, did you have any further thoughts to add? I don't think so. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Nancy. So how about you, David? Uh, what do you think about the part where CRC travels to all the different nations and tries to convince them of things and 
fails and has to move back to Germany? Uh, I don't think he so much tried to convince them of things. He was learning. He was learning uh, at all of those places. He, you know, he offers that um, they they aren't as good as us because they're not Christian. Basically, is how I read it. Okay. And part of that, he has to, this this document has to do it because there was no freedom of religion in sixteen. 14 anywhere in the world that i know of especially not in europe so if you weren't playing lip paying lip service to christianity you were in danger hmm. you know uh jews and muslims were third and fourth class citizens so when you say 1614 are you thinking of the hundred years previous to when the texts no were that would published? be that would be 1514 as yeah, the 100 so years previous we have but i'm talking about the actual documents the documents okay. pay hardcore lip service to christianity being the coolest thing ever while at the same time inferring that they have the true christianity and everybody else is an asshole especially catholics yeah so were these published in 1714 or 16 17 excuse me just My making bad. sure yeah okay yeah you know me the old, the, the brain is going I'm helping. That's all. You're helping. You, you always help. <laughs> all right. So yeah, um, trying to keep things kosher in 1714. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah do not get burned at the stake. Right. And yes. understand that during this time, if you did not wave the correct Christian flag, you were in trouble. I mean, if you were like Cagliostro, he, for some god awful reason known only to himself, went to Rome. And uh, the Catholic Church threw him in prison there for being a heretic. And the same sorts of things could happen anywhere. If you Depending did not on... sing the praises of Martin Luther when you were in Germany, yeah, it sucks to be you. <laughs> David, did you have any further thoughts you wanted to share? Yeah, I had, I had one more thing. Um, it seemed like the wise men of Damkar were more, uh, not like expecting a savior, but that they were clairvoyant, like they knew he was coming. They, they, uh, they, they showed him the secrets of his cloister and things like that. So it seems uh, like- You're they... reading right out of the, do the document there, I see. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, they it suggests that. I don't buy that. Uh, that's the that's part what, where that, that's the part where I said it's Tarzan syndrome. Yeah. Okay. Like yeah. the white savior complex. I've come yep. to enlighten you all. Yeah. Yeah, I am the chosen one. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. The chosen one would have to be a German. Couldn't be an Arab. Mm -hmm. Right. But it's yeah. good that you you re Yeah highlight that so that we can emphasize just how much of this is i mean as much as it's pointing at things that we would uh recognize let's say there is this undercurrent of an agenda of european superiority as well yeah european chauvinism is all exactly through this. Yeah. yeah yeah anything else david and i should say that I suspect, though I cannot prove, that the European chauvinism was a device in order to make the people who were reading the pamphlet more interested in it. Yeah, I mean, if we're coming from the point of view of this being a, you know, chaotic good manipulation, then it yeah. serves that purpose to use these devices as a way to yeah Make and it would rights. hurt their feelings if you told them the truth they would which is yeah, yeah which is you you guys think you're great but up until a century ago you were still digging your wells next to your outhouse and you don't really <laughs> know much of anything you guys still bleed people who are sick uh, that and that would thing. not go over well now, one of the interesting things, and this also gets back to the alchemical connection, is the idea that what you do if you are a Rosicrucian is you heal the sick. And that means 
that you have a profound understanding of manufacturing medicines, which was the uh, the purview of alchemists at the time. Yeah, we've talked about that with um, plant alchemy the past couple. Of yeah, weeks. yeah, and when I get my finally get it together with my friend the alchemist, and we interview him, uh, that's what he does. So. We will uh, we will delve deeply into that. Yep. Jesse, I saw you had a, something you wanted to share. All right, but just a, a question. I, um, and I'm not I'm an expert in any of this. It is, or you don't need to be. Scholarship yeah. anyway, yeah. so, None of us uh, are experts not, in this. Right. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, if, but just from my from my understanding and knowledge. So I'm just trying to understand then. So how then? So basically, you're saying the Rosicrucian then, because from my um, you know, reading and understanding it, the Rosicrucians were kind of tied back to the Templars, right? And that whole, the, all the knowledge that then it kind of comes up through that Rosicrucian stream, which leads into kind of the, um, you know, Annie Besant and Rudolf Steiner and all that stuff that was yeah. going on Blavatsky at the turn of the century there. At least that's kind of how I was kind of reading it from just my, you know, understanding yeah. from the Except that so, all of those ideas came centuries after this. Mm -hmm. You'll notice that in the Fama Confessio and Chemical Marriage, there's no mention of connections to the Templars. That, it, not to put too fine of a point on it, my personal opinion is that is a romanticized fantasy designed to draw in people to your group. So the, um, the entire Templar you're saying has been romanticized and, and elevated. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, because it's, uh, it's interesting. Yeah, the the Templars, uh, you know, the uh, Freemasons claim, claim to have connection to the Templars too, but again, there's not a whole lot of ev evidence that that's true. This is not to say that there might not have been one, but we don't see it's it. Just, yeah. No, yeah. I know. It's just it's the only thing for me with the Templars is that they had so much power, and we see so much of what happens in Europe. And, and even into the Middle East, right? Right. They, they, they're attached to it. Uh, and even like yeah. Portugal, right? When you get to the history of Portugal and that whole aspect of things. Uh, yep. So yeah, anyways, yeah, just, so it, just, um, it just seems that they must have some, but the whole Moorish aspect of what is what's the biggest challenge, right? We don't really know what the, what at least from my perspective, right? what, what Moorish, what that Moorish period in Europe really looked like and what, what Moorish culture that was being brought to Europe look really looked like even before Actually, we, we we do know what that looked like that is something that's well attested to it helps if you read arabic or at least that's have good yeah, translations for yeah. sure yes I, you know we yeah, uh, i agree that know, definitely would be where that information would be is in that part of the world i wish that it was yeah. more accessible yeah but yes in, please share sorry in the in the west we have downplayed that because um we don't like to admit what actually happened. So you know the, the history of Spain and the Reconquista, right? Are you familiar with that? Somewhat. Yeah. So 1492, famous year. There, there was a reason why Ferdinand and Isabella sent Columbus off to see if he could find a way to uh, you know, get to the Indies because they were broke from the wars. But in 1492, they finished conquering Spain. What that gave them access to was all of the Moorish libraries that were in Cadiz and Sevilla and all of these places. All of these books that had been translated from whatever language into Arabic. Uh, and that included uh, the Greek corpus. Before this time, Europe had lost the Greek philosophers. They didn't have much in the way of access to them. Uh, but they were all in these libraries. And sure. the, yeah, the Spanish court said to the, uh, uh, the, the Jewish uh, conversos, hey, translate this from Arabic into Latin for us. And that's how we got these books back. And that included books of philosophy, science, uh history all of these things 
medicine. That's the Renaissance. Medicine. That's what that's, yeah. that's what created yeah. the Renaissance. That's what created the Renaissance. Yeah, to a great extent, in my opinion. I mean, opinion. I agree theory, with you. But, I agree with you. Yeah. But I agree with you that. that yeah, that's the history. Yeah, and so we we know what it was like then. We know what. Spanish uh, Moorish Spain was like because we have uh, all of the literature that escaped the burning uh, by you know whatever Christian king was burning books at the time. Uh, you know we have the works of Ibn Arabi, right? Ibn Ar Ibn Arabi was a Spaniard who was born in Murcia, uh, and he he talks a lot about you know the what how he grew up and what was going on. Uh, and, you know, Morocco remained a hub of learning for hundreds of years after that. It didn't go downhill until the French decided that they wanted to colonize it. Um, so we do know a lot more than people think about what life was like in those places at that time but it's not something that you find in Western history books so often because it makes us look not so good. Does that yeah, help or make things more confusing? Yeah, does that help? Or it yeah, no, that make, it, it, it makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, I understand where you're going with that. Obviously there's, that's a, that's a, that's a whole can of worms, right? So it opens a huge, yeah. A huge, a huge door there, but it's uh, yeah. I mean, that's obviously where I think there's a lot of stuff there that needs to be cleared up. I mean, even your <laughs> image here of the Rosa Cruz is saying, you know, this is where the Rosa Cruz cross comes from. I totally understand and see that. However, obviously, there's many people that are scholars of Rosa Cruz that would say, no, that's not where the Rosa Cruz cross comes from. Not in that way, anyways, right? Yeah, yeah, they yeah that's what they say. Symbolic aspects. Yeah. They would draw, go back to the whole, you know, Templar tradition and then the Merovingian. There's just all this stuff with yeah. the bloodlines. They would go back to it, but they have no connection to it. That's the, that's the thing. There is no line of connection between the Merovingians, the Knights Templar, uh, the Knights Hospitaller, the Masons or any of that, and these three documents. And these three documents are where historically the Rosicrucians came into existence. Yeah. So when you say connection, you mean like, tr like a, a lineage of transmission, like direct. Yeah. Like, yeah. And there ain't one. I wish yeah. there was. I would love it if there was. I'd love to be able to hunt this back to its source. But I've been looking at this since I was 23 years old. And I have not found a single thing yet. That was like three or four years ago. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's I think that's powerful. That's very, very, very powerful. I got bunch, yeah, lots to think and chew on there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, uh, very, mean... very, very I think it's very it makes it, it, it makes in some ways, because of other things that I understand, it makes a lot of sense if what you're saying is true. But at the same time, it's such a right, but there's yeah. so much for me that I would need to I have to start going and looking at to really see yeah. if that is the, you know but i totally agree with you that it's in the sense that like we we don't there's definitely no connection that's being found yet uh, a yeah. direct proof of that it's all just hearsay and talk of yeah. the christian tradition for the most yeah. part I totally understand and there is no way that i can say that what i'm saying is true the best i can do is say what i'm saying seems near fetched to me right exactly yes i understand that yeah i totally appreciate that share that perspective in general <laughs> well likewise jesse i think it's good to especially because these things do have an active you know people who are actively within these groups and stuff and they have their stories that they tell and that is a deep-rooted part of how they under understand themselves and and we have to grapple well we are grappling with that on the edge of this conversation yeah yeah and it's funny how people do things like uh add stuff it's like you look at the amarch rosicrucians 
And they claim that their lineage goes all the way back to Akhenaten, right? The, uh, uh, the Tel Alamarna period of Egypt. Zero evidence for this. Um, but it, it's a nice story, again. And you have other Rosicrucian groups who, that claim other things. But again, without being able to back anything up. Same with the Knights Templar. Um, we actually just uh, passed the uh, uh, anniversary of the execution of Jacques de Molay, who was the last uh, Templar prior, the, the last head of the Templars, which was on the 13th. RIP, man. Yep. Okay. Um, but what happens is that all of these different groups try and give themselves legitimacy through making claims of ancient knowledge. Yeah. And claims and, on lineage and stuff are kind of a double edged sword, too. Yeah. And I can dig it. Uh, I would like to claim ancient knowledge. I have ancient knowledge. I learned everything that I know from a Neanderthal. It was my <laughs> gym teacher, but yeah. <laughs> well, I guess what I would say is to explain what I mean by that is that um, the fact that, not that this is a bad thing, but to get caught up in discussions about lineage can sometimes uh, distract us from the depth usefulness substance of the content and yeah. it can either be smoke and mirrors to hide the lack of depth or it can as i say be a distraction from the depth in that well you know it doesn't count for much because they can't trace their lineage back to so and so yeah and so for me what works for me is i look and i go this is what I can know. It's like when we were talking about the Emerald Tablet. I know that the first document containing the Emerald Tablet to ever appear in the world, as far as we know to this date when I'm talking, was an Arabic text in the uh, 8th century. Nothing before that mentions the Emerald Tablet that we have been able to find. So history stops there until we find something more. And it's the same with this. Uh, nothing before the Fama appeared. Yeah. So, but, you know, we can go all the way back to Atlantis. <laughs> and somewhat unrelated question. Sorry. Yeah. But, uh, I guess I'm really not directly on topic, but then, so what is your general take then on like the Nag Hammadi scriptures and the Dead Sea Scrolls? Do you then think that they are also uh, some kind of claims that are being, you know, uh, brought brought forth, or do you think they're legitimate finds at all? Oh, they're they're definitely legitimate finds. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no doubt about that, um, and they are important, and they have uh, interesting implications. One of the things that I love about the Nag Hammadi scrolls is that we got uh, a copy of uh, the uh, Gospel of Thomas. Uh, of which we only had fragmentary bits before. And that's brilliant to be able to see that. I think that that's a very important document. Same with some of the other things and same with the Dead Sea Scrolls, as much as they allow us to see. Uh, if somebody tells me that the Nag Hammadi Library originally came from Atlantis, I'm gonna look funny at them. <laughs> but they came from Nag Hammadi, they came out of caves, and their authenticity is pretty much attested to. All right. So with that said, James has been waiting very patiently. For okay, our, James, yes, yes, please. Make sure we get his thoughts too. Well, uh, heartened back to all this business of lineages and historical claims. 30 years ago, I can remember reading Francis Yates' The Rosicrucian Enlightenment. And to the extent that I remember it, her proposition was, while there was no actual lineage, no initiating order, da, 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 it was a, an injection into the culture of ideas. And um, the whole history of heresy, uh, like, what's what I'm saying? 
there's always been this underbelly of heresy of different thought of the human mind trying to break out into something different than the orthodox and it doesn't require some unbroken initiatory chain for that to happen and this desire to formulate these ancient histories and these initiatory chains and these lineage claims for schools and you know let's link the the templars to the scottish rite masons da da da, da is completely unnecessary because you have human creativity and spiritual insight in people who've never been part of any kind of school um yeah that yeah that's that's what i'm thinking of um so interestingly so, if you can yeah. link the templars up to anything i think it would be the scottish rite masons yeah, actually, I've had more sympathy to that in the past couple of years than I did previously, I do admit. Um, but what I'm sort of saying is you don't need to imagine it's so much like one industry order handing down specific grade material data as opposed to a, a subculture of mixing and matching ideas with not necessarily anyone being in control or, any, or being the locus of information or... Uh, do you think that that's that's I, I think that that's highly near fetched that okay. that is uh, one very likely explanation. I love uh, Frances Yates work. I think she's she oh. was genius. And uh, her book on uh, the memory palace uh, has served yeah. me well for decades. OK. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't argue with her. She's a very smart human being. Mm. Um, mm. and i think that most likely this was something like that whether it was sufis injecting something into western europe or like i said operation mindfuck mm. uh, a, a group of proto discordians going hey let's stir the pot yeah which is why i I'm, I'm describing this in short as kind of a chaotic good endeavor yeah it's, it's definitely <laughs> i think chaotic good in, in whatever way but uh yeah i think that of all of the ones i found that is the most near fetch proposition yeah the blue lotus thing though that's new to me i haven't bumped into that before yeah i find this interesting too and i i don't have enough background in this to really have a strong yeah. opinion one way or the other but it's interesting to me yeah yeah and i i can make an argument for this it would take a whole nother hour to do it and it would be kind of circuitous yeah uh and again it's not definitive mm -hmm. it, it there's nothing about this that is definitive but it's suggestive it's inferential but I think personally that um, knowing what I do about the areas and knowing what I know about the use of blue lotus in medicine uh, and in ceremony, that this is, again, liable to be near fetched. And blue lotus transports very nicely. You pick it, you dry it out, you put it in packages, and you can take it for months and months without it losing its efficacy. It's pretty even when it's dry. Yeah, it smells nice too. Mm -hmm. Well, at some point in the future, you're going to have to go on a long, circuitous one hour lecture <laughs> on the topic or something. I can't let you get away with just this. There has to be more. <laughs> you can well, probably talk me into it. I don't know how many people would be interested, but I could go off on that for hours. Yeah, we'll keep that in mind. Yes, please do. Thanks, James. Nancy, I see you unmuted, and then I would love to just touch base with everybody else before we say goodbye this evening. Um, okay, a couple things. I'll try to be fast. One it's of okay. them is that with the uh, mention of uh, the Moorish influence in Europe, I thought it was going to be about what was the, I don't know, emotional and intellectual atmosphere that made so much invention possible, which m that might be a thing where maybe you can yeah that's a, that's another hour's worth of talk <laughs> i should take notes then yeah yes yeah and well the related question of god knows i'm living in a culture that could use a, th a few truth bombs <laughs> but then you get to the question again of what is the capacity for invention that made the first batch of pamphlets possible yep yeah and we've seen this um uh, 
a number of times in history, most recently in the last uh, yeah, decade and a half, mm -hmm. something like this has happened. Uh, a person published a series of books. Nobody knows who he was in real life except for a few of us. Um, and then that was it. He never went, oh, I'm going to now announce myself and teach and you can come and be my disciple and things like that. He remained completely obscure. Uh, I think now people are going to be wondering who or who the hell talking I'm talking about. about and you're yeah. just going to have to wonder. <laughs> it's not fair. <laughs> Life is not fair. <laughs> Does that answer your question, Nancy? Pretty much it. One thing that did sort of shake things up that um, is, is the television show Roots. Apparently that led to a general increase of interest in genealogy, mm. which yeah. is probably in the harmless to good range. Yeah, likely so. So, Anybody Hind, else? what do you think? Yeah. There you go. Yes. Um, well, I think um, uh, yeah. Uh, it's you know I, I I've been reading lots about um, uh, Rosicrucian mm -hmm. and uh, and. Um, a little bit of Freemason and all the ancient uh, knowledge. And uh, with the Sufi, I can say that there is something in common with all, all these, all this knowledge and, uh, and the Gnostics and um, the, the, there must be something that they all have in common, something um, universal. Um, it would not surprise me. Yeah, yeah, not all details, but there's like an essence that that's that comes from. I can say that comes from God, or mm -hmm. uh, the universe. And uh, yeah, it's um. It's something deep, but once you want to know the the maybe the deep meaning of life, you can you can touch some aspects of that. Yes, and this goes back to uh, the Emerald Tablet and its first mm -hmm. line saying, "You know, this is this is truth, you know, universal, undisputed." Very cool, Hind, and I hope that, you know, as you continue to to study and learn more, maybe you'll have things you can share with us as we go along. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's where okay. that's why we are here to share. Exactly. exactly. Yay. Yes. <sighs> Jonathan, how about you? Yeah, I've got nothing to add, no. All right, that's not a problem. How about Levita? How are you doing? I'm doing okay. I'm just over here trying to tread water and uh, <laughs> not breathe any in, you know. <laughs> All good. I'm happy you're here. Thanks for hanging in with us. Me too. It, it's just, it, it, some of it sounds familiar, but it's not really. So I'm just trying to like take it in and kind of rearrange my thinking um, to, in, to understand it. I may suggest that perhaps a little bit of that is what Hind is hinting at as well. You know, this sense of, oh, there are common threads to many of these things. Yeah. Yeah. But just because something looks familiar 
doesn't mean it actually is. It can still be different. And I've kind of stepped in that particular pile in the past with other subjects. So I'm trying not to do that now. It's all good. I mean, just, you know, we're all here to learn. Yep. You got to be careful with things that look familiar, though. It's like, <laughs> I'm familiar with the California king snake. Ah. And perfectly nice snake. But if I happen to be down south and I see the California king snake and pick it up, it's probably going to be a coral snake. Mm -hmm. And that would suck. That would suck. Yep. We would miss you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly would. So we're not going to do that. No picking up snakes. No picking up snakes, unless no you know who they, they are. are. Yeah. All right, Sheree, how about you? I don't have anything to add that's really constructive. I agree with him <laughs> and Peter. Um, I hadn't been reading any of these things uh, for a long time. I was just trying to think back, I think 30 years. So. Mm. Yep. Okay. Yeah, that was when I was probably starting out on my own search. And, and so coming back to this, I've got nothing extra to add, but I like what Mushtaq said about this, this universal truth that we're all trying to find that thread and, and to qualify it. So, yeah, the search continues. The search continues. God damn it. The search continues. Thanks, Sheree. All right. Um, Mr. Keem and... And Alka, I don't know if Alka is like here to check in, but Mr. Keem, how about you? No, me too. I don't have any any question or any answer, and it's completely new for me. I try with to you. Yeah. just uh, just try to follow along and hopefully understand stuff. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thanks, Mr. Keem. Thanks for showing up. Alka, how about you? Thanks. So. I'm sorry, I didn't have a video on because I've been <laughs> really not looking very pleasant. Right oh, now. But I want to say something. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Please continue. Something. I was just going to say, don't worry about okay. that. We're, we're happy just to have you okay. present. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was really listening in. Um, I have no knowledge about this. So but I'm trying to keep an open mind. Uh, the things that truly resonated for me, uh, uh, one is the ease with which you teach this knowledge. Really, it's for me personally, uh, for somebody who has no idea about this knowledge, but only experiencing it herself and then seeking uh, like what is happening to me. Uh, this is a very uh, nice way of uh, keeping your mind open and listening to these amazing talks. And um, so two things that truly resonated for me was uh, the good chaos that you said. I, I thought that was awesome. <laughs> and, um, and the idea uh, that Mustaf was talking about, that, hey, you just throw the idea out there and humans will find it. Um, I, I think uh, for me, that's the thread perhaps that's happening to me that I'm because I'm keeping my mind open. So, so much is happening. Um, so I truly, truly appreciate these talks. Thank you. Thanks, Alka. It's for those kind words. I mean, I... <sighs> Sometimes we just, I mean, even me, we show up because we want to learn something new, even if we don't really have the, we're not equipped to wrap our head around it immediately. Sometimes we just have to let go of trying to understand the specifics and drink it in as part of the grander endeavor here, which is hmm, to wake up and to notice sometimes what it takes to both wake up ourselves and give people a gentle nudge ideally to see if they can do that for themselves as well well i don't want to wake up can i go back to my sleep <laughs> 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 <No one. laughs> 
Yeah, there's a place for easier. that too. Yeah, there's a place for us to to retreat into rest from time to time, and that goes for all of us, not just you. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Anybody else? Did I miss anyone? I don't think I did. I don't think so. Yeah. So I'm going to switch us, switch us over to Brady Bunch mode. Voila. And here we are. Voila. Well, here we are. Party time. I guess I'm going to just wrap us up as we usually do and say thank you to all of you for being here and hanging yeah. in there. If this is new stuff for you. It's, yeah, and all of you are great. You all yeah. had really useful things to add to this conversation. Including just your presence. Yes. Don't forget how important that is both to us and to the building of the field here, so to speak. So without further ado, as we like to do, we have our little ritual of waving to each other. Going. Bye, y'all. Yeah, I'm waving to everyone who's watching on YouTube, and we will see you later this week.